Yes. <laughs> I wish that would stop it. But it has been kind of a long day. Uh, you know, just <clears throat> uh, in reference to what Henry was saying <clears throat> about uh, capitalism and the environment, I don't know. Do, do any of you watch CNN in the morning? I watch it on the news for like I see it for 10 minutes or something like that, 15 minutes, just to kind of see what's happening in the world. And every morning, this is like around the eight to nine o'clock hour. There's just one commercial after another. First, there's this smiling, I would say ghoulishly smiling, uh, so-called uh, someone who supposedly works at Exxon Mobil, and he's telling you how safe fracking is. It's really, you know, they got it under control now. It's not any worse than it is the other kinds of uh, extraction and refining. And then there's another guy from Exxon Mobil who comes on, you know, and he's telling you how. Uh, uh, the tar sands are okay. They're fine too. Tar sands, tar sands it's, it's all fine. And then there's a, a woman, I never really got this one, who like walks through this strange set. She's uh, you know, back and forth and she's telling you how uh, great natural gas extraction is, which is also really related to fracking as well. And she says that 9 million jobs in the United States are dependent on this. And then there's another guy from another natural gas association so he says there's three million jobs, so I don't, they don't have it quite, you know, coordinated there. But <laughs> there are no ads that say fracking is a disaster and it poisons people with groundwater, or that the oil sands take three times as much energy to extract uh, as they will produce in energy and to produce that oil, and it's extremely dangerous. And, and how come? How come there's only those ads? And there's no ads that tell the truth. Because there's no money for the ads that tell the truth. Nobody has that kind of income. ExxonMobil has made more every quarter, I think, for about the last five years than any corporation ever made in history. So they have a little extra to propagandize you. <laughs> and it gets you to the essence, really, of democracy, too. But that's the democratic discussion that's going on. Now, of course, none of the hosts or reporters or CNN are going to say, that's a bunch of bull, because they're paying for, the, for CNN. And so, you know, the, the essence of the democratic uh, discussion, the so-called democratic discussion, I think can be seen in this way. That, as Gloria said this morning, you get as much democracy as you can afford to pay for. That's the reality of the democracy. And we've heard a lot of good discussions today. I don't really want to go on too long, but to say this, that I think most of the people who came here today, including people who have left already, and, and it's been a long day, agree about the criminal, criminality of the system. But still, the question remains, is it possible, really, is socialism in the United States, the most capitalist of the capitalist countries, the imperialist superpower, with its vast array of repressive tools and wealth concentrated at the top, is it really possible for us to conceive of socialism here in the United States? And I believe really we should turn the question around and ask instead, is the question, is the continuation of capital still feasible? And let's consider a few facts. Here in the richest country ever in the history of the world, a sixth of the population officially lives in poverty. One sixth. And that's not really how many people live in poverty because that's with the poverty line of $22,000 a year for a family of four. You know, so let's think about what we're, we're really talking about. A third of the population in the richest country that's ever existed live in poverty. Um, that three and a half million people a year uh, in this year will at some time be homeless, and a million of them will be children. That 44 million people officially, again, these are so understated, experience food insecurity at some time in the year they've run out of food, that means. That um, 50.7 million people, they say, have no health insurance, but another 50 million people have health insurance that's so bad they can't use it. So really a third of the population, I believe, has no effective health care. And it goes on and on. 43 million people get food stamps, and probably an equal number really qualify but don't get food stamps. 
and the police brutality. There was a whole workshop on it. That is epidemic all over the country. And the wars, war after war after war. And while they say there's no money for all these things that we need, there's always money for the next war. There's not even any question about it. When they started a the, the new war in Libya, no question. And our heroic, and I'm being sarcastic, you know, again, our heroic <laughs> Congress people and senators, regardless of party, will always vote for the, the military budget, year after year after year. And the war in Afghanistan by itself costs $330 million a day. And it's one-tenth of the military budget. There's a banner up there by Teachers for Public Education. One day of the war in Afghanistan equals 6,600 teachers pay for a year, calculated at $50,000. Every day, while teachers are being laid off. And it can go on and on, the environmental catastrophe that is brought about, as Henry so, you know, and so gives such evidence for, about they don't care. They, they're not thinking about sustainability. You know, there is a, a Native American saying about you have to think about the seventh generation down the line. These people are thinking about seven years down the line. They're thinking about the next quarter. And it's not because they are just, you know, evil, greedy characters, and they are mostly evil, greedy characters. But it's because if the head of Exxon Mobil, making more money than any corporation has ever made by far in history, goes to the board of directors of Exxon Mobil tomorrow and says, look, the people of the country are suffering, and we're making so much, we have so much money, we don't know what to do with it. Why don't we cut the price of gas a dollar and a gallon and give everybody a break? He'd be escorted out of the room, and behind him is a line of 20 vice presidents who are ready to step up and take that position. It's a system. It's a system that is driven not just by profit, but by the need to maximize profit. That all those corporations and banks, no matter how big they are, and hasn't this crisis just proven it again, no matter how big they are, are in a competition to the death with each other over who will make the most, who will be the most profitable. Who would have imagined four years ago that the Lehman Brothers uh, long-standing banking house, investment house would disappear, and that Merrill Lynch would disappear, and that so many banks would disappear, big banks, folded into others because they didn't make it through the latest crisis of capitalism. It's the system itself. And what is capitalism really, anyways? What does it really come down to? What is capital? Capital isn't just money. The money in our pockets is not capital. Capital is a particular form of wealth that can take the form of money, or factories, or hotels, or, but it acts and must act to enhance its own value. And it can only enhance its, its worth in one way. Not by smart entrepreneurs or clever trades. That all comes out to a zero-sum game. It can only increase its wealth by the exploitation of labor. The secret that is hidden, not just the bad capitalists or the greedy capitalists, as someone was remarking earlier. Capital represents and expresses also a social relationship. Some have it, most don't. That's the social relationship. And the ones who don't, have to go to work for the ones who do. Or they have to apply to go to work and oftentimes be turned down. How hard is it to get a job right now for people? Any kind of a job. What's the unemployment rate? I mean, what's the real unemployment rate? How many people are really underemployed, so severely underemployed or unemployed altogether, they can't really get by? It's so, 25 million people in this country. And many of them, you know, have a lot of skills and abilities and so forth. Um, and why is that? Why are so many people unemployed? The corporations are sitting on $2 trillion in wealth. The workers who could go to work are there. And the need is there. The need to create the things that society requires. And in many cases, is urgently required. There are 10,000 bridges in the United States that are dangerous and need to be fixed. There's no health care system in the United States. Uh, the, the Obama plan does not create a health care system or even pretend to. We need to build thousands, tens of thousands of clinics in every neighborhood in the country, build a health care system like the Cubans did from the ground up, where every neighborhood has a clinic, and then you go up to 
through other institutions of healthcare. That could put to work millions of people building and staffing those clinics. We need to rebuild the, the schools, particularly inside the cities, and hire more teachers, not be firing teachers. 32 or 35 kids in a class? Come on. You know, and so everything that's needed is there. The money is there, the resources are there, the workers are there, the need is there. Why isn't it happening? It's not happening because the capitalists who control the capital, the wealth of society, have other ideas and don't care, are not motivated in any way, shape, or form by what people need. They are motivated by that, what I was just talking about, not just profit, but the maximization of profit. And you know, we could build renewable energy in the United States. Millions of, of people could be put to work doing that. Unemployment is a disaster. It's a disaster for people on an individual level. It causes families to break up. It causes domestic violence. It leads to drug and alcohol abuse. People are depressed. They take it on themselves. I can't get a job. We're taught if we can't do it, you know, there's something wrong with us. The system teaches us that. It's a personal, it's on a personal level, it's a disaster for tens of millions of people. But it's also on a societal level a disaster. All of those things that could be done to improve society that aren't being done when all the means to do it, to do those things exist, that's a tremendous waste for society. Not only in the United States, but on a world level. And again, why? And again, the answer. That they control the wealth. We have no control over that. We can't vote for more housing. We can't vote to spend the money, the wealth that they have, the capital that they have, that we produce. The working people produce all that wealth. Why do they have it? You know, in the last year of his life, Martin Luther King, in his last speech to the, his organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, said, why is it that some people own the timber, and some own the water, and some own the oil? The simple answer is they stole it. <coughs> they took it. That's how they got it. And the stronger of them took it from the weaker of them. Uh, and that's the process of capitalist accumulation. And they gained their wealth by exploiting the workers and exploiting the world. So in reality, what we have is a the propagandized image in the minds of the great majority of people that we live in a democracy when in reality we live in the brutal dictatorship of the rich. They make the decisions, they make the wars, they lay off the millions of people, they pollute the earth, they don't care. And the world and the people of the world cannot stand the system for very much longer. But I said before that the system of capitalism, we should ask the question, is it feasible anymore? And I think the conclusion is, it's not. But that does not mean that it will come to an end. The reality is, is that no system collapses, and particularly the capitalist system, will not collapse on its own. No matter how great the contradictions and the problems that it has. If we don't hit it, it won't fall, as a, 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 a revolutionary saying. Uh, we cannot predict when a revolutionary situation will come about in the United States. That is a situation that was described earlier uh, as one where, uh, I think Layla described it earlier, as one where there's a crisis, in, a great crisis in society, usually brought about by war or economic crisis, that a great mass of the population can no longer live in the old way, cannot accept it. We can see the beginnings of that right now. Whether or not it turns into a huge mass movement in the United States, we don't know. But the Occupy, and if you boil it down to its essence, I think is this, is we can't stand this anymore. That's what's motivating people to go out and stay out. We can't stand it anymore. It's when millions and millions of people say, we can't stand it anymore, that we get the second condition of, for revolution, for a revolutionary situation. And the third, as, as she said, 
and as others have said today, is that there exists a revolutionary organization that can unite a critical mass of the population across lines of nationality and race and religion and ethnicity and language and religion into being the mighty force that can bring an end to what is a rotten and corrupt and criminal system. And so we know that in the history of the world, as was also said earlier, that all of the empires, and we live in the vastest empire of all, all the rulers of all the empires always think that they will last forever. And probably the Assyrians thought that, you know, three or four thousand years ago, we'll always be it. The Assyrian Empire will live forever. And none of them do. And this one won't either. Thank you.